Okay, start the introduction. <laughs> I, <laughs> I thought I was, Robert. <laughs> Ready? Thank you. So Doug's d Doug did his work with his colleagues on the online system at SRI, but their work enormously influenced what happened in the early 80s at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, and that, as we know, led to uh, things like Lisa and Mac at Apple, which in turn led to Windows at Microsoft and so on. So there was an enormously visible trail from Doug to our industry as it exists today. And I hold him and his group personally responsible in the good sense, I want you to know, for building augmentation systems to do outline and hypermedia editing of a very fancy kind, for computer-supported collaborative work, for inventing the mouse and two-handed input and TV display technology. All in the 60s, folks. I want you to remember when this was all happening. His was also the shop that I came to that for the first time really made it clear what the power of good software engineering could be. They wrote meta assemblers and meta compilers and all manners of tools to help them build tools to make good things for end users. But he also thought about how tool building should help the end user. He thought about the process of introducing new tools and how processes must change in the organization, how the organization itself had to evolve to make use of the tool. Got us familiar with the term bootstrapping, bootstrap institute, bootstrapping yourself and your organization. He and his people put on what is still today, in my mind and other people who remember it, the mother of all demos. It is still unsurpassed. It happened at the Fall Joint Computer Conference. It was beyond bleeding edge, and it came off beautifully. We're going to be privileged to see a little footage from that in a moment. And finally, very personally, after I learned about him, I was privileged to spend a couple of uh, days in his lab stealing his best ideas and implementing uh, many of them in our next hypertext system called FRESS in the late 60s. Doug, it's a thrill for me to welcome you here. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is a, a real treat and a, definitely a little bit um, a wash in trying to, trying to uh, tell what I'd like to tell as something that fits into the Bush picture. And I think the best thing I can do is go sit down and start giving a presentation. Uh, one thing, though, I can tell you is my first introduction to the Bush thing happened just slightly less than 50 years ago, maybe three or four weeks less than that, that there was a young sailor boy that was plunked down on an island in the Philippines to await assignment to some local area uh, work. He was an electronic technician, and he'd been through years of electronic technician training and shipped out. And uh, very interestingly, that just as his ship was backing out and steaming around the San Francisco Bay to go out, there were many, many whistles and toots and everything else, and we thought, gee, do they celebrate everybody leaving <laughs> that way? <laughs> and it turned out it was VJ Day. <laughs> and uh, so 68 days later, at eight knots, we got out to the Philippines, et cetera. But in waiting around for a week or something like that in that camp right part of the jungle, I wandered around one day, and I found this Philippine hut. They, they really are up on stilts, and animals live underneath. And it was all nice and clean, and it said Red Cross Library. So I climbed a little ladder, and it was a very pleasant room in there, about 20 feet on the side. It actually was a very nicely outfitted little library. And with the thousands of Marines and sailors around like that, there wasn't a single other person in it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I spent many hours in that. So I found that Life Magazine uh, article on Bush, and I always remember it was very exciting to see that. And I'd have enough technical training by then to look at it and think about it, et cetera. So it didn't become an impact thing that drove me the rest of the time. What I'd like to do is go sit down here now and tell you the stories of, of what, what to me it, the uh, potential is. And
and I would very, very much like to have been able to work with Bush and talk to him. And I tried one, once sending him a, a, um, a letter and sort of an outline draft I'd made, and I didn't hear back from him. This was in 1962, and it, uh, somebody had told me that he, he'd, he's already so old and he really was in a rest home or something and probably wasn't returning. Well, turns out he lived another 12 years and published books, etc. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't aware of that then. One of the things that you have to realize is living way out there in the Palo Alto area, <laughs> that you uh, tend to feel that MIT was the center of the universe then. And then just to prove it that I worked for years by 1962-63. Really, the, my push started in 1951 about committing a career to trying to do the most to help humans cope better with complexity and urgency. And computers and interactive use was yeah. the idea that came to my mind and I actually envisioned how that would work. And that engineering training and the technology and the radar made me realize that anything a computer if it could punch cards and print, pa print on paper, it could create any kind of image you wanted on, on a screen. And it could interact with humans uh, easily, interactively, etc. So I just pictured it working interactively. Well, of course. Uh, this is a very naive country boy, you understand, that is still a, a country boy. <laughs> naive. But anyway, so I said, all right, there's a direction. I'll go back to graduate school. And Berkeley had a research program in computers. They had an O&R contract to build one. And I got my PhD five years later or something. It still wasn't working by then. <laughs> but anyway, the, um, and the first computer conference I went to was down at UCLA in 1953, I guess. And practically, you know, it was the, the, that year's computer conference. And I think there were 65 people there in a lecture hall in, in UCLA. So if you think back in the history of things like that, you have to realize the emergence very slowly of something the rest of the world wasn't paying much attention to. And so the cost of things relative to salaries, et cetera, was much higher than it is now. Um, but anyway, for me, the, that pursuit of saying, what can you do to help work with complexity and urgency in which the real problems humanity faces, those are collective problems. And so be from the beginning, it was the collective capability of people to cope better. And um, so after, I don't have time to go into all of the, the odyssey to the years, but uh, I SRI until 1977, then and so I sold, sold the rights to this NLS system out in the commercial world. Otherwise, we lost our research and they were money and they were going to dismantle it. So we got a chance to take it out, some of us. The rest of the people went to Xerox Park. We, um, so we lived in the commercial world, selling the service of this system out to TimeNet and, and ARPANET. And a lot of pilots, it was built to support people and work. And, uh, and then McDonnell Douglas bought Timeshare and TimeNet in 1984, which gave me the opportunity to go knocking on the doors of this heavy industrial domain, talking about the kind of things that I'd been wanting to do for a long time and had built. And it was very interesting that the architectures that we'd evolved were the first thing that appealed to them. It's essentially a, a very sturdy prototype of the client-server model with very special ways in which you could deal with uh, you could deal with uh, variable, variable classes of workstations and variable classes of users looking into the same work domain. But uh, then they, they got interested in the hyperstructure of groupware things too. And that, that just opened people's eyes immensely. But during all that time, the, the, we built a system to use it, and it evolved under constant heavy use to do all of our work. So, and by the time we'd gone out and worked with other organizations and seen what happens when you introduce things like that and get people to adapt themselves to use it, our, our image about the problems, the challenges, the potential, the requirements, etc., grew to be somewhat different from the rest of the hypertext world, 
which was was a problem in itself because it made it harder to be to be part of that world. So anyway, the um, so anyway in 1989, my daughter Christina and I formed Bootstrap Institute, saying the the real need here is a strategy for how the world can really go after the potential of boosting its collective problem-solving capability and begin using the term collective IQ in a very real sense. So the, the presentation here is all built around these boxes. About eight or ten of them are paradigm issues of some significance. And it had occurred to me after quite a few years that, that to walk up cold to people and start telling them the potential that was there and the path to go after it we had a great deal of problem because of the ways our minds get fixed about certain things. Uh, we grow up in an environment and we just take much for granted. So these paradigms are the important ones. And in this presentation, I can just go highlight any of these boxes in this way, or I have also the option of saying, show me a brief little subtitle under it. So I'll march through the subtitles to give you an orientation and then dive down underneath some of these boxes more deeply to give you the right kind of presentation. So the way of characterizing the objective here really is high performance organizations. That means their ability to cope with complexity, et cetera, whether it's developing new products or coping with national issues. And if you're going to make a really difference in that, it became apparent very early in my studies by the early 60s that you had to deal with the whole capability infrastructure of an organization, not just think you could make some high level capability improve a lot by some veneer layer thick new technology. No, and in fact, really with all study of that, you realize that with all the technology you bring in, it joins the ranks of a lot of artifacts and tools through all the centuries, any one of which being introduced, if it's any significance, makes a difference in human organization, structure, conventions, a lot of things there. So the real thing is the whole that augments the native human capability is the mix of these both in a coherent system. And the focus on tools alone, if you're going to talk about very significant improvements in the technology, the focus is not enough to just on that. So we'll go into more of that later. And then the need for a pragmatic way in which both sides of those are going to co-evolve. The human system side has just evolved organically through all the centuries without much explicit attention. But when the technology started to erupt in the Western world with explicit focus on it, et cetera, then it sort of, that was driving the world and the rest of it followed. And uh, so one says that's going to be very complex issue and problems. If we're going to invest a lot in evolving our organizations, et cetera, It'd be nice instead of step-by-step-by-step by step by step investments if we had some way to invest in that change that compounded. There'll be a huge social investment, really, in this change. And uh, uh, so the technology side of it may only be 10 or 15 percent of the total cost, if that much. And so how do you want the best strategy, say, like that? Well, do you want a criteria for investing? Yes, a whole set of them, right? So what came out of this in the end was it'd be very important to make, pay attention to the infrastructure of the way our improvement processes and change processes work, which is a very haphazard way as it is now. It turns out that if you're looking for sort of the most payoff investment criteria, that paying attention to the improvement infrastructure gives you a real chance to get a hold of a strategy. And out of that comes a, a sort of a strategy of saying, look, if you're going to improve the end capability, for instance, in product cycle time, if you also can at the same time be trying to use some of the similar capabilities that you're going to improve to improve your improvement process, you'll really start bootstrapping. And that's the basic thing. Diagrams I had in my 1962 paper, et cetera, like that, were just full of all that kind of feedback between elements and such and realizing that. So it turns out that this this kind of collective knowledge work, you know, the concurrently developing, integrating, and applying knowledge in any collective sense is a real key to that. It's an extremely important end product for organizations to have improved. But if you do get some of this going in small groups even, 
and a high level of new capability in that, you can plug that into the improvement cycle to accelerate it. So that's, that's the thing. So that's why we call it bootstrapping. Improving your improvement process, picking yourself up by the bootstraps. So that's a strategy we're trying to tell the world about. So, yep, the old guy is still pushing like crazy. <laughs> kind of thing. So then you find out if whatever technologies or capabilities you're bringing in there, they have to have essentially global interoperability, that this is really going to be a, a collective thing. The conventions that they were showing about in, in documents, about footnotes, uh, how you cross-reference things, make indices, table of contents, those are conventions that go along with the technology of the time. You bring in a brand new technology and there's a new set of conventions that you want to adopt to take advantage of those. And those in turn are dependent upon the structure and conventions by the electronic form of the documents. So those have to grow into something globally interoperable. And as they get those standards, they don't want to be derived by shallow sort of potential uses. Because there's a very deep, very broad, very high performance in the end collective capability you've got to pay attention to. So the pursuit of something called an open hyper document system under there is a very, very high order business to be attending to. So we say, and how should that be done? So it really needs to be done in a, in a pursuit that's working towards this kind of goal. So a very interesting item here becomes, how do you start best deploying early gains and down there you realize early gains aren't necessarily going to be the most payoff if you try to bring everybody in the organization up. But if you can bring special teams of people up where you really explore the potential and they have a role in the organization as it is now, there's a, a lot of reasons that from our experience will just make that be one of the high payoff things to consider. So you have choices all the way along of what you, what you improve and where you invest the actual improvement capabilities that you've gotten. So in the end, it comes out to be uh, network improvement communities are strategically an extremely important sort of thing. That you get a community of people trying, that they're going to share the improvement pursuit within that community. You get them connected to a network and you give them these new capabilities so that they can cooperate upon that improvement process. It says, great. Especially if you want to say, hey, what about the pursuit of this, this Kodiak stuff? <coughs> Why not do that in this same sense as an improvement community? And at the same time, you're really pushing the best open hybrid document system potential you can. So that seemed like such a glorious kind of potential thing to do that that's why we started the Bootstrap Institute to say to people, look, there really is something there we can go after. And the company that learns best to do this is going to be ahead. The country that learns best how to go after this is going to come out ahead. And maybe even mankind, how much will it impact the, the, the chances of survival of a human race that so far isn't paying much attention to keeping its world something that is a long time survival environment. And uh, social problems, economic problems, political issues and problems, psychological ones, many kind of issues there are really severe and they're put to test our collective capability which if you look at it, isn't a very good scheme. So, um, I'll go down under this box a little bit to, to check this thing like this, that in the early 60s, after a decade of having this dream of gold and doing other things in the way, but I got a chance to start trying to write a framework paper about, hey, how can you really augment? And as I started listing all the neat things you could do in the tools, is when it really dawned on me that you have to list these other things that are given to the raw human being as he emerges into a society in order to, to be capable of operating. So the net capability is the basic human mental sensory motor bundle of potentials in there that have to be trained, conditioned, et cetera, et cetera, in order to really harness. Give him all of this and train him and condition, et cetera, inside of that. And this system augments the human. So that's all we have. And so tacking things into here have that same fundamental. Well, I'd already been in the late 50s just realizing that all my dreams of this depend upon the assumption that computer technology, digital technology is going to be very much cheaper, very much faster, very much higher capacity, et cetera, et cetera, like that. 
And the only potential is if it really gets much, much smaller. So they were talking about the, you know, uh, chips, putting all the stuff on chips, etc. So I did, I got a, a research grant to do a study about the dimensional scaling of electronic components. That means as you cut everything down by a factor of, say, 10, well, different phenomena shift at a different rate. Some of the phenomena depend upon cross-section area, some upon a linear dimension, some upon a volume. So each of those, you know, characteristics or something is going to change differently with the change in scale. If you have a device that depends upon the interrelationship of this phenomenon and this phenomenon, as things get smaller, they just might get out of contact, and they really will. An airplane won't fly just by making it, you know, one-tenth the scale unless you keep a certain combination of parameters constant. So one of the things then I read was in biology, a lot of interesting things about the scale in biology, why, why north of Spitsbergen there aren't any animals, mammals smaller than a fox. Well, it turns out that the surface area to volume increases as you get smaller. You make something half the size, it's got one quarter of the surface area, but one eighth the volume. So one eighth of the volume has got to generate with its metabolism the heat to lose over a quarter of the, you know, you, you've got twice as much space per unit volume, surface per unit volume to have to support heat. So you get down to a certain size, you can't do it. And many other things. So one of the, one of the real lessons of that study, well, it's interesting to know, I became convinced, okay, semiconductors are going to run out of gas at a certain size because of just basic phenomena. But there are a lot of other phenomena that will start being a able to effective. And so the whole push in, in um, nanotechnology is just exactly right. So there are inevitable things going to start happening like that so that the speed, speed price, cost, everything are just going to, we haven't even started yet. So the, on the right, you look at things on the right side there and say the, the change in scale of capability on the right of the tools we're going to be able to have and the domains they can operate in and the pervasive impact in this side are going to be of a scale change we've never experienced before in history. When, when a, a terribly, terribly, terribly primitive people found they could harness fire or find they could put skins together and make clothing or make shelters, those were very significant high-scale impacts on their world and the left side would change a lot. But since history started and we became aware of how the left side here can change, we've never had to accommodate something such a big transition then. So we're totally unprepared. And if we were prepared just because of scaling phenomena, we'd start looking up and down all this thing and say, what are the candidates for change in almost any category in the human system? And you find it's ripe for candidates for change. And they may do it. So one of the problems, though, that's been occurring is typified maybe by 1975 when the world started talking about office automation. That's what we're going to do over here, automate the office. So this NLS system sitting over there, my God, what a crappy mix of things that has, so hard to learn, et cetera. Oh, that's way off the beam, see. But it isn't. It, we're going to be augmenting over here, which means looking at a particular potential over here, you don't look at it. You, you, you shouldn't look at it just how it fits today. How does it fit into different conventions and practices, et cetera. You got to look and say, well, how are we going to evolve? So. It's this, this human augmentation system plus people gives you that capability infrastructure and that's an extremely important sort of thing to do. So anyway, it was that, that perspective that led us then into saying essentially what you're going to talk about is this dynamic knowledge repository, and browsing and editing. This today, we're really getting these things in, in co-evolved so that with an ordinary web browser, you can start diving down more deeply into the environment we've been used to or stay out in the web world like that. So capture management repository and integrating the group where it was sort of a slant. But where did it start? Shared files, of course, but not for one minute did I think about that. I looked at that language aspect in that human system and said, there seems to me a very critical thing. As you work with concepts in your mind, 
They're structured and related, etc. A lot of explicits and some associative, yes. But when you externalize those concepts, you give them real symbols in your mind and work with them. And then when you externalize that, that's the real way in which you share with people and work, either verbally or on, on writing. So what can you do that's new for candidate? Well, gee, <coughs> you can try getting that structure so it sort of tries to map better the structure of the concepts in your mind. <coughs> so it's, it's more than just not linear, it's structured. And the relationships between people with a lot of concepts can have explicit relationships. And you can interlink them by cross-citing. Those are two separate kinds of aspects of it. Also, you said, oh, I don't, you know, I, I can look for lots of different views once I have it in there. The computer can help me put it in there, can help me view it, not only move around there, but view it. So we generated quite a few optional views. One of the things we said, oh, the view of looking at a page is literally the last thing we want to do. That's before we publish or something like that. When you're working online, we don't want to bother with pages stuff like that. So that's something where we right away departed from the rest of the world. WYSIWYG, we laughed at it. We said later on, hey, look, the last thing you want to do is make it look like a piece of paper I mean, you're gonna, if you're going to go print it. But if you're going to really use it online, there are a lot of things about pages and all that that get in your way of what you can do. And the browsing, shared screen was an important thing from the very beginning that I want to be able to work with my colleagues. From the very first concept, that was the way. So we built that sort of thing into it. So if I, um, one of the things I've got to do is, you know, we're already running quite late. If I run another two hours, <laughs> <laughs> what should I aim for? And Okay, another half hour. Good. All right, I'm going to dive into quick pictures of some of the things we built back there in those days. So here was the first, the second interactive display that we built to run on a second computer. And you say, well, that's a pretty big box, isn't it? Well, yeah, because you couldn't get memories in those days that could give you bitmap memory. So you couldn't make a bitmap screen. So what you had to do was draw everything you wanted by deflecting the beam. If you wanted a big tube that had visibility and bright beams, it was a very high voltage, high accelerated beam that was hard to move. So it took big heavy amplifiers to move it. And that those could have very fast response so you could do it quickly was hard to do. So this box here, oops, <laughs> this box here contains the amplifiers to move the deflection. Oh, what generates the display? Well, you see this box over here has all the stuff that generates the deflection for the display. So the two together are the display system, a separate from the computer. And that was, we had to get that custom made for maybe $80,000 in 1963 or 64 money, which was a lot of money in those days. So he says, all right, it, it, was it was expensive to do that kind of research. So we, one of the things we want to do is try different kind of selection devices. So this was one of them, and Judy's sitting there holding that. We tied it, quite a few of them, and one of them we tried was this beautiful thing made out of wood. And here's another interesting connection with Van Dwar Bush, that, or whatever it is, Van Bush, <laughs> the, uh, uh, which I didn't appreciate at the time, but I'd seen when I was an undergraduate a device that's made up of a couple of arm linkages. You move a pointer around a closed area of some chart you've made, and by looking at the wheels that are on there, et cetera, you can calculate the area that you've enclosed in this tour. And I wondered how that worked. So the professor said, well, uh, a, a wheel that's moving sharp like that will only resolve the direction it's rolling. If it slides sideways, it won't resolve that component. So it just sums up the component of, of displacement in the direction it rolls. Well, that's all that this was then, is two different orthogonal wheels rolling on the surface. So it's related to the way that the differential analyzers uh, ball disk stuff work like that. But I didn't, I didn't make it back, excuse the expression, to Bush at the time. But anyway, that, that's just one of all the nice things, even though we tried uh, a knee, a knee thing. You move your knee up or down by pushing on the floor or wiggle it sideways. And we picked the shapeliest knee to get the photograph, of course. <laughs> and I made a head pointer, but uh, we, we, the mouse really worked. 
The other thing is the parallel input. While you're pointing, what are you going to do? So we said, we built this and my kids learned it. We talked to each other. Very simple. The letter A is the first one. B, two of them are C. This one alone is D. It's just totally binary. Turns out kids learn it very quickly. You just draw one, two, four, eight, and 16 on their fingers and tell them how you count. And they pick it up right away and then say, look at the alphabet. So that makes a big difference when one's working. In 1967, we actually had a system going where we were having online meetings for this way. But we went up, when we were going to get a time-sharing system, when scaling again, you could get much cheaper, higher resolution speed on a small tube. So we get a bunch of them, we could time-share and put an industrial camera shroud to look at it. And this, this produced the video out in the room and we time-shared, drawing the pictures on these little screens like that. And so that was an innovation that let us get a laboratory equipment out there. And so merely having two big frames like this, our you know, character gener uh, display generator for 12 workstations out in the lab, and it took uh, a lot of maintenance. <laughs> you have to realize that. But out in the laboratory, a simple monitor and a key set and a mouse and a keyboard, these were standard sort of ways. And standard because of the way things operated was uh, well, we experimented with different interfaces, but this is the typical way. Stand, stand, sit there with mouse, key set, and shift to the keyboard and get long literals. But the speed of operation, I don't think it's been equaled since. And so I, I may be one of the first people in the world who had a private workstation in the office just to do my daily work all the time. And the other people worked out in this bullpen out here with all of them. It was a really interesting social thing, which was an important way in which everybody learned together about how to run it. Well, we wanted to give a show of that 1968 thing, so we borrowed some of the cameras and get a tripod up there and borrowed people to come help make camera working. And up in the Brooks Hall in San Francisco, we had a big video projector that could put something on that screen. You could see a little bit of it now that you could read from the back of the auditorium. And we had to shift, sh we had to lease newly, in, you know, they had to go out and put temporary video links from SRI to the 35 or 40 miles up the city to run this thing. And up in the front, I was sitting at a console there and there was a camera above looking down and another one mounted on the console looking at me. And in the back of the room was our director, Bill English, who put all this together. And so while it was running, I could be demonstrating things and talking. And so, We'll run a little bit of this footage, and it's, you have to realize that it's the system we had been using and working with, so it could be used both as a presentation thing and as a work example. The world's first picture of a mouse, this was moving up there on one half the frame, you could see the cursor moving on the other, and the, uh, the way in which the controls would work was also pictured like that. And one of the things that was important, well, Jeff Rulison had been with us a couple of years by then, and was responsible for a lot of the architecture underneath. And he showed up today, sitting over here, where now works at Sun. So he came online, and unfortunately, when I took 20 minutes of clips from that hour and a half video and put them together, as I picked when Bill Paxton came to share screen on it, instead of when Jeff would, or you could have seen that. So let's, let's run a little bit of that video, please. And, uh, So this is 1968, and I, if I'd known Bush was still alive and active, we made... Three I years. hope you'll go along with this rather unusual setting and the fact that I remain seated when I get introduced and the fact that I'm going to come to you mostly through this medium here for the rest of the show. And I should tell you that I'm backed up by quite a staff of people between here and Menlo Park, where Stanford Research is located, some 30 miles south of here. And uh, if every one of us does our job well, it'll all go very interesting, I think. <laughs> the research program that I'm going to describe to you is quickly characterizable by saying, if in your office, you as an intellectual worker were supplied with a computer display backed up by a computer that was alive for you all day and was instantly responsible, responsive, <laughs> instantly responsive to every action you had, how much value could you derive from that? 
Well, this basically characterizes what we've been pursuing for many years in what we call the Augmented Human Intellect Research Center at Stanford Research Institute. So look what else we can do in here. I've got this file that's structured. If I want to see what's in there, I can walk down the hierarchy levels and see or return. But there's another thing I can do. There's a root dice that I have here. So here, I'm afraid I'll need a different picture than you. <laughs> so here's what I drew with a picture drawing capability here. It's a slight map if I start from work. And here's the route I seem to have to go to to pick up all the materials. And that's my plan for getting home tonight. But if I want to, I can say, the library, what am I supposed to pick up there? I can just point to that. And oh, I see, overdue books and all. Well, there was a statement there with that name on it. Go back. What if I, what am I supposed to pick up the drugstore? Hmm, I see, very interesting. All right. Market? Oh, I've already seen that, right in the snow like that. Hmm. Gee, that's too much. Anyway, so we have this feature of structuring our material hierarchically, being able to move around it very well. When we get a hierarchy, such as I can show you here now, I can do things if I want to just say, I'd like to interchange produce and canned materials. Bingo. And they're all numbered right if I care to look. Interchanging them very quickly. Cans are going to inter inter get interchanged with produce. They do it and all gets renumbered. So I have ways of studying over, making different views, moving around, going to specified points, and modifying the structure. At the same time, I've seen that I have a repertoire of different entities. My character, knock off that character. Replace the character, make that P. So I have entities of all sorts that I can say I want to do operations on, and this basic structure that I can move over and study and get about very quickly. So that is the essence now. That's the essence of the tool we have, there are a lot of details that I've left out for you. And now I'd like to stop a minute and just make sure you understand we're shifting from illustrative material to the real working stuff, in case you wouldn't recognize it otherwise. We've had, uh, we've used this tool to do our daily work and it's, our system has been built, this time sharing system for about six months now, it's been working. And in that time, we've gone from getting one console to getting about six working now with 12, six more due the rest of the spring. This is our fourth computer in which we've had this kind of a system, so we've learned a lot about the user features we want and how to be fairly skillful. But this next step about learning how, when you're faced with having this in your office all day, as I now do, in a very exciting sense, how do you put that to work for yourself? How do you organize your files? What kind of things do you do? So. To get going on this, let's switch away from the tool we have here and talk about some of the general features of the program, some of the ways it's built, and get back a little later to the nature of, the, of uh, our usage of it. So that program involves about 17 people together with the special laboratory facilities we have. It's sponsored by government agencies exclusively, ARPA, NASA, and RIDC now, and in the past, AFOSR and ESD, and these were the people that first grub staked us many years ago. All right. And it's been a goal-oriented pursuit for many years. And I think we can just go off and get a quick little picture I sketched to show. This is the staffing over the years from 1950 on. And it's had slightly bumpy history. During these years, there was only one of us. <laughs> I go back to where I was and say, let's continue on in this file. That link took me out to a different file, to a statement for that view, and I jump back to this file where I was, and now within this file I make a link to another to say, the HIRC is pursuing these goals. Basic goal, improve the effectiveness with which individuals and organizations work at intellectual tasks. What does their effectiveness involve then? Better solutions, faster solutions, solutions to more complex problems, with better use of human capabilities 
really thinking about that. But a corollary goal is, besides improving the effectiveness, to develop a system-oriented discipline for designing the means by which greater effectiveness is achieved. That's very important to us. The approach for this should result in the system-oriented discipline. Let me just show you how I constructed this file. You notice underneath there was that and that. There was just a link hidden here that went back to this view with a slightly different view parameters. To give you that view. All right, there's another one hidden there. It says the general approach for us, empirical, we're pursuing this monstrous goal, monstrously difficult, to, by building and trying empirically, and we're approaching it evolutionary-wise because we feel that it's a whole system problem. You need to get a person in that environment working and looking at the many aspects of his working system that are involved in his effectiveness. That's many more things than just these computer-aided tools. In a large system like that, we need to do it evolutionary-wise because we can't be analytic enough about it at any one point to decide what best our next thing should be. We can only decide from here, as well as we can analyze it, where we can invest our next resources to get the most return at an increase of the effectiveness of the system we have. And this item down here is the term bootstrapping applied in a slightly new sense. We're applying that to our approach, where we're saying we need a a research subject group to give them these tools, put them to work with them, study them, and improve them. Aha, uh -huh. we'll do that by making ourselves be the subject group and studying ourselves and making the tools so that they improve our ability to develop and study these kinds of systems and to produce, in the end, this kind of system discipline. So it's been a, it's a struggle doing it that way, but it's beginning to pay off. Oh, <laughs> I, uh, I was attempting to run. The, these are clips taken from an hour and a half, and uh, there were a couple things in there I really wanted to get to, but the time's running too short. To, uh, we brought, uh, during that hour and a half, three different people were tuned in up uh, that their faces appeared in here, and we were seeing their work, or we were sharing the screens together, et cetera, and uh, one of them I was hoping to get there and show you, but uh, uh, these videos are available if people might be interested in them. But what I wanted to do was come back to this screen here and um, to the, the right. That we sort of s saw the mix in here, and in those intervening years after that, we, we did a, a lot of, of things that were much, much beyond what we've been talking about here. And, uh, the, um, when we got here and we were talking about this is the kind of thing we displayed at the time here and they were shared files so and our software was all being done that way and when Jeff Rulison was one who came, whose face was brought up and he was showing the structure and all of the software it's sort of like that but the next thing we did was integrate email because the next two years later we started operating on the network with the second node on the ARPANET and we were to provide the network information center. So we were providing integrated email in which these were the hyper objects that could interlink between email and to the shared file. And at the same time, another thing which is a very significant sort of part of our work, which has a, I don't see it used yet out there, but just made an immense difference in how the dynamics of the dialogue go on in there, that when you submit a document to this software and administrative operations system called the journal. Uh, it would get cataloged. You would do it in a way similar to launching an email with more new fields that could go into the catalog. And instead of s sending the content in a message, you could just put a link to some other file, and that would get cataloged. And then the system guaranteed that any time ever more you access that by a link or any other way, you were guaranteed you'd get what the author published on that time, and the publication was not just a year like they are now, but a day and a minute down there, because a few minutes later, somebody could have put a response in that cited yours, et cetera. 
So the dynamics of all of that for managing dialogue flow was just perfectly. When you watch email in a lot of conference <coughs> things out there and you realize you can't do that in there, the, the, anyway, it's a it's very significant difference to that. Well, I, I terminate. We can literally spend hours in all of this, and uh, if I want to be any kind of a friend of Ed Landy Van Dam's in the future, I'd better get through. But see, what's it worth, Andy? <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> the uh, one thing that really helped me a lot in trying to portray to people what I sense about all this is to take those two major dimensions of the augmentation system and make it like a frontier. You have to realize that each of these dimensions in turn is a multi-dimensional vector. And to array that along a vector line such that you can say that's increasing system improvement would be hard to put to done. But just picture it that way. And we can picture today out here some frontier boundary. But we're pretty sure in 20 years there'll be technologies available to harness that, that are way beyond that. But similarly, people are beginning to realize about the process re-engineering that's potentially available, the new skills, the new roles, et cetera, that can go on the organization. Those all make something in this vector. Our organizations are all clustered down here now. The product people are, maybe the most of them are out here someplace close to the edge of what organizations can use. But they're not going to make things that organizations can't use yet. So what is an organization? If somebody brought a, 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 com a technology that was way out here that could really provide really new changes, would there be any market for it? They wouldn't picture any. There's no market pull from the large user organizations that uh, clusters or communities that could benefit by this new collective capability they don't know, they don't have the experience to know what they want to yet. Because this is an un unexplored frontier. Exploration has got to be more than just people writing papers or a few graduate students trying something. To explore it, you really have to put up a group of people that's going to live that way to do heavy knowledge work that's representative of what it's going to be like when they're part of a larger collective organization. And it's like saying we need outposts out there. Well, you could put one out there now that used the forefront of what technology and the product line could cause, or somebody could bring out some brand new technology and sort of say you can harness that in the most advanced uh, process engineering organization. But where's, where's this as a frontier? And where's this? And where's the responsibility lie in our society for exploring that frontier? Enough so any kind of interested organization says, God, we've got to get out there because if we don't, the ones who do are going to win. See? That's true for a country too. So who's going to do the exploring? Because it's very different from a group of people that can make an exploratory technology and demonstrate it. This is where you've got to have people who've adopted their learning and working basis in there that's in a way that's like he says, oh, that's representative enough of how my or whole organization work or some significant part of it. I'll move one department or one division or something out there now. All right, you have to realize that the cost of moving vertically in this space is much higher than moving horizontally. And that if the horizontal thing keeps plugging out there and forces organizations to zigzag out here, that's extremely expensive. So you say, ah, oh, industry and the product people would never do that, would they? Well, ha, huh. you know, the personal computer field was about 10 years old before they started doing anything significant with the networks. And yet when they began 11, 12 years ago, it was clear there'd been 11, 12, 13 years of experience with the ARPANET where it's very clear that anybody who's going to really work significantly at an interactive terminal wants to be connected. And yet there was no provision for it. In fact, it was rejected very adamantly. Like, sort of like the guy that went around and says, oh, geez, none of the girls in this county want to get married. How do you know? I asked them. <laughs> so it's sort of like, I asked these guys, how about connecting? And I'd get very flat pictures that that's not what you want to do. Well, anyway, that's 10 years of lost opportunity for our society to start learning how to harness all this, thinking about it, et cetera. So 
we've got to do better. And who? So there's several possibilities. You know, you know, cooperative, collective, end user organizations or communities that get together to start investing in it. A government role could be in there too. A government role could be there to say, let's, let's if we get communities of users that say, hey, enough of us are significant going to want to set up an outpost that they could start underwriting some of the technology here that could do that for that group if they get the feedback so they co-evolve together. Because there are endless places in the military and the rest of government where you could apply much improved collective capability. So that's the end of my presentation for all this. Um, and, and I really kept wishing now, more than ever, that, that we had cans, three, three half hour cans of 16 millimeter film were what resulted from that presentation in 68. And I really wish I had known that Bush was still alive and active and I would have sent that to him because it could have made a lot of difference, at least for me, to get connected with him like that. So a great deal of respect for what he, he did, etc. And I wish I hadn't had to go off somehow on, on uh, sort of a lone vector of this. Okay, that, that's it, Andy. Are we still friends? <laughs> Modesty, as always. What I'd like to do is, uh, since Doug quit exactly on time, is give him the 10 minutes he earned uh, for Q&A and some interaction with the audience. Do us a favor and please go to the microphone, identify yourself, and speak up so that you can be recorded for the record. Of course, you can always just pass on it. We can quit. Anyone to the microphone? Bob Kahn. Those uh, reels of tape to Vannevar Bush, what kind of reaction do you think you might have gotten back? Well, that's, that's a very good question, Bob. I'm sorry you asked it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what my experience had been from the 50s, even for many, I mean, still often is, people that I would have thought would get excited about it would get turned off or would feel like um, that, you know, I was invading some domain as a alien stranger who didn't understand that domain and was talking about bringing toys to bear that didn't seem relevant. Um, you know, one thing is experience that stands out very much in my mind in the very early 60s, 60 or 61. Uh, I had a chance to visit, I was invited to come and talk uh, to the group at the Institute for Behavioral Science or something like this, that were the people who came on a year's uh, sabbatical to Stanford and sat around and thought and talked about behavioral science. So I went over and talked about this time. And uh, afterwards, sitting out in the patio at a picnic table with four of them, I started to get really beaten up. And turns out one of the guys had been specializing in information retrieval for decades or something like that. And he felt, honestly felt sort of violated that here's somebody talking about some, bringing some toys in that didn't understand what information retrieval is about, that the professionals have it under control and that I should just get out. I don't have the same years of experience with that. People in psychology, people in social science, people, but uh, I, I would get that very often through the years. And uh, so I, if, if Bush had gotten back in touch, I, I wouldn't have been terribly surprised if he'd responded that way. But well, I kept trying, and I would just have delighted if, if with his experience, et cetera, out there and his contacts, if he could have sort of participated with me somehow in saying, okay, where next? Um, did I answer? <laughs> what else? 
Doug, if um, your work had not been interrupted in the mid-70s at SRI and funding had continued at a high level, uh, what are some of the other things that you think you would have worked on? Well, we, we had we had a program actively started of, of enlisting organizations that could access us through the ARPA net to start learning and trying. And we would have been just going after that, that bootstrapping um, where, you, you know, you come into an organization and you can't expect them all to go change. So, it, and you can't, you can't expect just to wheel in a bunch of a truckload of technology and expect them to change. So we'd start out by saying, you have to appoint somebody, hopefully not a programmer, <laughs> that we're going to call the architect of your knowledge workshop. And that has to be a person that the user group that they're interested in respects this person as understanding their work and their job, et cetera. And that person's going to be the architect working together. And we support that person and learn a lot from that person and go involved. So we had a prototype community like that going that all just got clobbered. Etc. But then there are many, many technical things that we just were waiting to do. We very much would like to have added speech so you could have recorded speech inside of there. And of course, the graphics would have been better. And, uh, you know, to learn how to interface with CAD systems and database systems and the like. So there's a lot of evolution. Uh, I just, I still think it's there to go after. Um, and the things we've been doing now are realizing that the World Wide Web just gave the world an extremely exciting stimulus. It just was, it's a priceless thing. And it would be very nice if somehow that momentum can carry on to say, look, not just for publishing, but let's move that kind of capability into what we do every day, minute by minute. So every m memo I write is linkable to. Let's make it so every object in it is addressable intrinsically that I don't have to go put a tag on it in purpose so somebody can cite it. There's a, a list of about 15 things like that I, I wrote down last spring <laughs> that, um, anyway. I, <laughs> I'd be giving you the whole lecture, wouldn't I? Paul, <laughs> just to follow up on this, this speculation of uh, what might have happened if you'd gotten a little bit better communication channel with, with Dr. Bush, when we, we found your letter in the MIT archives, it was from around 1962, and from what we could tell, his health had been up and down at that point, and he clearly wasn't around when the letter arrived, and it was a secretary who responded. Now, just also to give a little perspective, there was a large, uh, was a large technology effort here at MIT in 1965, I believe called the Intrex Project at the library, where they were trying to create the library of the future back in the past, and they were doing this with combination of microfilm readers and electronic computers and they made a tremendous effort to get him to both come and speak at a, a large conference and uh, interact with the people thinking that he would be interested because they felt that what they were doing was clearly related to his work and at that point he'd really distanced himself from this he was willing to come and give a 10-minute speech but he didn't seem to be all that interested in uh, interacting with people who were following it and I think part of it is this paradigm issue that, that you were on the other side of. He was very much an analog machine person, yeah. and he felt rather uh, uneasy with people who were dealing with digital machines yeah. because he wasn't the expert in digital machines. He was the expert in analog machines. And I think you, were, you in a way, were suffering from that problem. You were a future expert on a technology that most of the experts at the time didn't really understand. Yeah. I, I've just learned a lot of that uh, what I really think is that the biggest limiting factor in whether our society or how fast our society can really integrate the potential of all of this rests upon the paradigm shift factor. I call it the paradigm shiftlessness. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that it's a very natural thing and, and I felt very injured by it for a while and then, then I this introspection you're supposed to do, I realize I do it too. Mm -hmm. That people can be trying to tell me something for quite a while. And somehow later when I find out that's what they were trying to tell me, then it's easy to be angry at them because they didn't really explain it right. <laughs> I'd like the privilege of the last question. Doug, what do you think the hardest several research problems are that remain to be solved at this point? What do you think we need to put our focus on?
Well, I, I think it's the, the research environment is uh, the biggest thing, is getting where you've really got groups of people that are committed to really change. And that, and in my sense, to get, to get them, you almost have to recruit, advertise, recruit, and put through basic training and equip and train like you would if you said, I'm, I'm going to take a bunch of flatland people and train them to be ski troop or something. You've got to equip them and train them before you can start learning what it's going to be next. So that's, that's what I feel. High performance teams are something we should really go after. Okay. With that, again, it was terrific. It was a privilege having you here. Plenty of opportunity to say hello to Doug and buttonhole him during coffee, which starts now. We'll reconvene here in 25 minutes. Coffee is upstairs. Bathrooms are around the corner. 25 minutes, we start again.